Jesus, as we kneel at the foot of your cross, help us to see and know your love for us so that we may place at your feet all that we have and are. Te alabamos, Cristo Señor. One thing that dominant culture cannot tolerate or co-opt is compassion, the ability to stand in solidarity with the suffering of others. It can tolerate charity and good intentions, but it has no way to fight solidarity with pain or grief. In this gospel narrative, two ways of being in the world are highlighted the way of compassion and love that suffers with others, and the way of anxious violence. The contrast between the two couldn't be clear. Jesus is immersed in the land of anxious violence. It is a land of death, of shouting soldiers, restlessness among the crowds, crap shooting for his clothes hammering custodians with nails, a chaotic place where there is no hope. It is not unlike the land we inhabit with its proliferation of more guns, a more sexual violation, more incarceration, more manipulation in government, more destruction of the earth and less tolerance and empathy for the least of these. Like the actions of ICE, Jesus' execution is destroying his family, as executions by empires always do. These are all the marks of the land of death. The citizens of the land of death worship muscle and militarism and reject vulnerability. In the Roman socio-gender hierarchy, that meant that where your body fell in the system determined the amount of power and control you had over other people's bodies. Elite males could abuse anyone below them without consequence. The world was divided up into penetrating and non-penetrating categories, and women were at the bottom of the heap. The cross was an assertion of brutal dominance perpetrated on those who challenged masculine power. Rome is showing everyone that these bodies executed aren't real men. They've been fully compromised and stripped of any pretense of power. Jesus dismantled the power of death by submitting himself to pain and grief and embracing the vulnerability that dominant society wants to deny and kill. Because to live in that world and ours is to live at risk of feeling abandoned to face free fall and absence and aloneness that goes all the way to the bottom of reality. We are so radically vulnerable to trauma. Every day, families close to us and families far away from us experience a beloved son or daughter or fluid gender child, mother or father, that is torn away by violence or poverty or oppression. Trauma has the power to shatter meaning and separate our minds from our bodies. It can capture our imaginations in never-ending cycles of fear and despair. And just bearing witness to dehumanizing brutality is traumatizing even if it isn't personally experienced. And I'm going to admit that for years, I dreaded this Friday service for that reason. I found it difficult to bear the brutality. It triggered memories of the death of my father, which for me had been powerfully traumatic. 
I found it really difficult to imagine how this day was good. Furthermore, my church followed the classic church practice of turning pain into guilt. And I felt responsible for Jesus' death in a way that was neither holy nor healthy. Now, I knew there were things I had done and left undone that were hurtful to others, and I was very grateful to God that I was forgiven. But that old narrative placed blame on me and all of humanity for our vulnerability to death itself. I, along with all the rest of us, was held responsible for vulnerability itself. It wasn't until my early adulthood that my experience of the Good Friday service changed when I was introduced to a new narrative, a healing narrative around Jesus' death. This narrative emphasized that our vulnerability belongs to the healthy original persons we were created to be by God. It is with us from the very first moment of our existence. Human vulnerability is not chosen, not punishment, not an aberration related to sin. We do not on our own have everything we need. We are not on our own everything we could be. It's how God created us. We are radically vulnerable to trauma and death. And this reality does not evoke God's rejection or judgment, but God's fidelity. God meets our vulnerability with tender compassion and unending mercy. God's loyal love is the counterpoint to our vulnerability. I came to understand Jesus' self-offering not as a ransom for my soul, to appease an angry, violent God, but as solidarity with my suffering. In compassion, God poured God's self into the world that included anxious violence and risked being torn and fragmented. God's creative power comes through powerlessness and humility. Jesus is the king of love. In Jesus, God is dying with us so that she can transform all that ails us and traumatizes us. God's fierce bonding love can't stand apart from our suffering. And that put good in Good Friday for me. Several years ago, I visited the Museum of Terror in Berlin. The museum fastidiously documents the rise of nationalism in Germany and Hitler's reign of terror. And an exhibit there particularly captured my interest that described the training of SS guards. The goal of their training was to systematically sever empathy. Guards were admonished against soft emotions like pity, kindness, neighborly love and humility. Encouraged and celebrated instead were hardness, self-discipline, hatred, and contempt for the losers who were not like them. Added was an intense militarism that saw the SS as part of an elite order fighting for a better Germany. This indoctrination to perceive racial others and state enemies as undeserving of pity, created a framework where the guards saw their acts of wanton violence against those same enemies, not as a crime, but as part of their patriotic obligation to the Nazi state. In the arrangement of lawfulness in that empire and in ours, the one unpermitted quality of relation is compassion. And in such societies, compassion constitutes a radical form of criticism. Just ask our current administration. Because compassion and love that stands in solidarity with the suffering of others announces that the hurt is to be taken seriously 
and that there is a moral imperative to do something about it. And most of all today, in this service of Good Friday, we stand by Jesus who chooses to stand with us through pain and death. We stand by Jesus like the Marys and Salome and the disciple Jesus loved. We stand by Jesus who represented the power of kindness and compassion, the power of love that stands in solidarity with the suffering of others. He showed us that forgiveness will outrun violence and generosity will beat fear and hate. Jesus was not afraid of bullies. The empire executed Jesus for being an empire, the state that it had no power to destroy his love and compassion for the world. As his execution destroyed his family, Jesus had to make a new one. In the last words of this gospel reading, he makes a new family, not of blood connections, but of love connections. This family overrides all the old kinship loyalties, calling us to new siblings and inclusive family ties. This may have been a surprise to both Mary and the disciple whom Jesus loved, we don't know. May we be surprised as we ever widen our circle of compassion. God's will for life is stronger than death, Violence and abandonment do not have the final word. Today, we recognize the power of death that tries to do its best to talk us out of our God-given life and well-being. We acknowledge the anxious violence that can grip us when we live apart from trust in God's love. But the God of holiness and compassion defeats all empires with vulnerable love. That Jesus I want to stand by, especially today when his pain is most horrific. This service, I finally understand, gives us the opportunity to do that. And so, we bring our compassion to the foot of his cross.